not only that, but our grain and our food production is actually decreasing now. It peaked in the 1980s and has declined steadily since in the U.S. and the rest of the world, which means we're now facing the most widespread hunger and starvation in the history of the planet. <coughs> we're also doing substantial damage to our forests. According to the 1996 report by the consultative group on international agriculture research, this is funded by the World Bank and the UN, 72 acres of rainforests are destroyed every minute, most of which is being cut and burned to create agriculture. At this rate, 38 million acres per year are being lost. And if we keep going at this rate, the entire world's rainforests are going to be gone in our children's lifetime. We can actually see the end in sight. And trees, they're our planet's lungs. You know, we breathe the air, especially the, the rainforest trees, because of their large leaf surface area. And because of all this burning of coal, of oil, and these trees, that's what's causing the wild extremes of weather worldwide, according to many scientists. The list goes on and on, but I'm going to stop here and I'm going to ask you all a question. Is it apparent that a lot of these problems, in some part, stem back to industrial agriculture, to see the connection there? And can we all agree that our agriculture system is pretty messed up, it seems, right? And it needs changing. But how many of you knew this before I just started talking about these problems? Is this repetitive to some of you? Is anyone feeling a bit down right now? A little bit sad, a little bit angry? Like you're not really sure what you can do, being one person, how you can solve these problems? Show of hands, is anyone feeling that way? Because I am. I don't like presenting this stuff. You know, this makes me really sad, it makes me upset. But it's really important to, to identify these problems because without the problems, we you know, don't know where to go for the solutions. So I was this business student a few years ago, seeing all these problems, hearing about them, thinking about what kind of job am I going to do? What kind of work do I want to go into? And you know, I went into green building, and then I heard someone come in and talk about permaculture. And it just knocked my socks off. I was just like, wow. Permaculture can do that. So he showed me this video, and I have that video today. And this video is really what inspired me to do the work that I'm doing now. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. So we went and had a look, and we thought, oh no, <laughs> this is like, this is the end of the earth. This is like as hard as you can get. This is hyper arid and it's 10 acres of almost dead flat, completely salted landscape, 400 meters below sea level, the lowest place on earth, two kilometers from the Dead Sea, right? To about two kilometers where Jesus was christened. We hardly got any rainfall. We've got temperatures in August that go over 50 degrees. Everybody's farming under plastic strips. Everybody's spray, spray, spray. Everybody's putting synthetic fertilizer on. Overgrows the goats, just like maggots eating the flesh off the bone, down to the bones of the country. Literally like maggots, giant maggots eating it to nothing. So we designed up a system that would harvest every single bit of rainwater that fell on it. On 10 acres, there's one and a half kilometers of swale water harvesting ditch on contour. And when they're full, one million liters of water soak into the landscape and they'll fill quite a few times over a winter. And then we heavily mulched those swells with organic matter, which was trash from organic fields nearby. We put that almost half a metre deep. So we saved that and mulched our swells, which were about two metres wide and half a metre deep on the trench. Then we put micro-irrigation underneath the mulch. And then on the uphill side of the water harvesting trench, we put nitrogen fixing, very hardy pioneer desert trees which help shade and reduce wind evaporation and also put nitrogen into the, into the soil and structure the soil for us. And then on the lower side of the trench we put uh, fruit trees, major in date palms as the long-term overstory in the end. And then we put in figs, 
uh, pomegranates, guavas, mulberries, now some citrus. Within four months, we had figs, a metre high with figs on, which is impossible. We've done a course, a man and female course, trained up some locals, and we got a translator who's working for the project. He had his degree in agriculture in the Jordan University. And he got on to his mates and, and said, in the agricultural department, well, he said we couldn't grow figs, we got figs growing and we got figs on them. You better come and test the soil because no matter what you say, we're either growing in salty soil, what we shouldn't be growing, or we've desalted the soil. And we like to know what we've done. And they came in and the salt levels were dropping. So they became interested. The salt levels were dropping around the swells. So they said you must have washed it through. See, normally put a huge amount of water on and wash the salt through to the lower levels, which just makes the ground water more salty. In the end, you'll salt it 20 metres deep if you keep doing that. And then it will take a thousand years to recover. And we use only one fifth the amount of water. So the water they thought we'd washed it all through. No, we'd use one fifth. That really got them when they ripped through those that much water we hadn't used. We, with the same amount of water normally used on that much area, we could have done 50 acres. Originally, people laughed at us because we didn't put straight lines in. We went on contour with these swells. They thought, why don't you put, so you've got a bulldozer, you can flatten the desert, you can stretch, and we wouldn't want to go on contour because we've got a longer edge and we harvest the water passively. Then we planted more non fruiting trees than we did fruit trees. So they laughed at us. This is what we do. Done productive things, more productive things. What's the point, you know? In, in soil, they won't even grow anything, so, you know. And then, and then we covered all the inside of the swell with a huge amount of mulch where they scrape all their organic matter off and burn it, like most traditional agriculture. In the middle of winter, we got a funny email saying, we've got a problem. We've got mushrooms growing in the swell. Well, they called it fungus, but when we saw a photograph of it, it was mushrooms, because they'd never seen mushrooms, because they'd never had that much humidity in living history in the soil. And when you open up the mulch, there's all these little animals there, you know, there's little insects, and the soil has come alive. And the fungi net that's underneath the mulch is putting off a waxy substance, which is repelling the salt away from the area. And the decomposition is locking the salt up, and the salt is, is not gone, it's become inert and insoluble. So we could, we could re-green the Middle East, we could re-green any desert, and we could desalt it at the same time. And, and, and if we can do it on an insignificant, flat, little bit of 10 acres of flat de desert, if you give us something with catchment or a wadi, or you know, canyon or any of those erosion gullies, we can turn it hard away completely. You can fix all the world's problems in a garden. You can you can solve them all in a garden. You can solve all your pollution problems and all your supply line needs in a garden. And most people actually today don't actually know that. And and that makes most people very insecure. In that video, they talked about how permaculture can solve some of the world's most pressing issues. They talked about growing food in soil that became a desert. You know, that's, that's incredible because no one can grow food in a desert, apparently. But this guy, Jeff Lawton, did. And so if they can grow food in a desert, then we can definitely remediate some of the soil that's our farmland or some of the soil around here to grow food, even a grass lawn. So we're going to explore that later on in this presentation, but we're first going to get into the ethics of permaculture. So permaculture is about taking care of the earth. Probably got that from the video a little bit. If you take care of the earth, then it's going to take care of you. But permaculture is not just about taking care of just the planet. We also have to care about each other, too. And that's a big part of permaculture is people care. So which one of these do you think is more important? I'm posing this question to you all right now. What do you think is more important, earth care or people care? So what I'm going to have you do for the next two minutes is talk to your partner. We're going to do what's called a think listen. By partner, I mean the person sitting next to you. So for a minute, we're going to have one person talk and say, what do you think is more important, earth care or people care? You can also talk about the video if you're not sure where you fall on this. And then after a minute, I'm going to say switch, and the other person is going to talk. So one person is just talking, and the other person is not talking back, just listening. 
That's why it's called the Think Listen. So find someone sitting next to you. I'm going to give you one minute to talk. <laughs> for a couple of you all to share. You can either share what you thought or what your partner thought. So, who wants to share? What's more important, earth care or people care? Yeah? You all said that earth care is more important because uh, people are one species and the only importance that we have about the rest here is to give ourselves. So, mm. Who agrees with that? Who's all about earth care first? Okay, that's good. Not everyone though, so who thinks people care is more important? Yeah, you wanna share? Thinks people care. It's like if everybody genuinely really cares about the well being of one another, and in turn we won't be polluting, we won't be destroying the environment, we won't be taking care, we won't be stewarding the environment and caring for each other. That's great. And you said you can make the argument for both. So who thinks both? Both are important. Yeah? They are. If you do both, then you're going to reap abundance. That's what permaculture says. The third ethic of permaculture is all about resource share, or share share, equitable distribution of resources. So if you have a lot of people working together to get a job done in a garden at the same time, if you have a lot of people working together, you can produce more food and more resources. It's also a lot more fun when you're doing things with other people. When you have all these things, then you can share them. You can share your time, you can share your energy, you can share the food, the resources. 